there's something to be said with celebrity. Uh, first of all, the fascination with celebrity. We like to build them up to tear them down. Startling accusations against P. Diddy continue to dominate the news, with major accusations revealed in a bombshell lawsuit. But the suit wasn't brought against Diddy alone. Well, I think one of the number one rules of litigation, you know, like it or not, is you go after the deep pockets. Among the defendants in this civil suit, multiple record labels and studios. But should they have been listed in the first place? It's not surprising to me that they were named given the relationship, but it doesn't necessarily mean there are merits there. We're taking a closer look at the record labels and executives listed as defendants in the most recent lawsuit against Diddy and what that means for the music industry. But when you start getting a company, you know, a label like Universal, which is one of the biggest labels, um, being named, they, you know, they got a their own team of corporate lawyers that are uh, going to jump on it and also put pressure, um, you know, on the on the artist to either settle it out or cooperate. The person at the center of all these allegations is 54-year-old Sean Combs, known by multiple monikers from P. Diddy to Puff Daddy, Puff or Puffy. You know him as a rapper, label executive, and entrepreneur who's made his mark on the entertainment industry over the past three decades. In recent months, though, allegations about the darker side of Diddy have been revealed through multiple detailed civil lawsuits. Entertainment attorney Mitra Ahurian says there's likely a reason all these allegations are coming out now. There's been such an undercurrent of people in the entertainment industry sort of knowing about some of this or knowing rumors. So my initial sense is it's a long time coming and why now? Um, and the why now is, of course, you know, following on the slew of lawsuits in New York. I believe there were five of them, one of which settled very publicly, um, you know, against uh, people who alleged that he sexually abused them. Um, and this was allowed because of the New York Survivors Act that extended the statute of limitations from five years to 20 years. So you could go all the way back. And so you had a lot of adult survivors coming in, uh, filing civil lawsuits. And I think because of some of those allegations, I mean, these, you know, they're very wild allegations um, that it sort of opened the door to criminal investigation. And then I think that's when everything sort of blew up and everyone has an opinion about this. According to Mitra, these allegations aren't entirely new. You had mentioned that this is something people had been talking about for a while. Is this industry talk, so to speak, that this had always been rumors about P. Diddy? I think industry talk, there's a lot of people who, you know, who have worked for him. There's been stories around, which is, you know, not necessarily unusual for, uh, you know, for somebody who's that big in the entertainment industry and in music and film, you kind of get, and particularly musicians, it almost feels like they get away with a lot of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll um, culture. Um, with Diddy, particularly, there's been other, you know, something beyond that, really, that's always been rumored. Um, and then there's been sort of these allegations of violence throughout the years, really dating back to, you know, the the Tupac, Biggie, you know, that era. Um, you know, they were all in a in a culture that was very specific and very different from where things are now. I think things, in a sense, have sort of calmed down, at least in the mainstream hip hop community. But back then, it was very much, you know, this element of violence was very much part of that culture. And I think that with everything that was surrounding that, it's not just the entertainment community, but there are people who work who work in the entertainment community. There are people who are, you know, tangentially part of the entertainment community. So it's not, it's just when you're in a metropolitan area, and I think New York is sort of the same, you do have stories that are, you know, first and second hand, um, that isn't necessarily something that's whispered about, but just, you know, somebody might hear something from a friend. Mitra herself says she's heard stories of Diddy in the past. I heard something years ago from somebody I knew that was one of his assistants. And, you know, you kind of hear these things and typically you're not supposed to hear these things because there's NDAs, but word sort of gets out. And I'm not saying these specific allegations, but things that are sort of along the line to the point that not everyone was very surprised. 
To understand the accusations Diddy is facing now, we have to head back to last fall, when multiple lawsuits were filed against Diddy, namely a lengthy suit filed by Cassandra Ventura, who you know as singer Cassie. Cassie's lawsuit was filed under the New York Survivor Act, what Mitra brought up earlier. The act meant that any sexual assault survivor could bring forward a civil suit against their alleged abuser, even if the statute of limitations had run out. So that's just what Cassie did, laying out some pretty major accusations about Diddy's character. She says Diddy beat her, sometimes so severely that she had to hide out in a hotel for days at a time, waiting for the bruises to heal. Cassie also alleged Diddy raped her and forced her to have sex with prostitutes and even recorded it. Then there's the allegation that Diddy got jealous when Cassie began flirting with rapper Kid Cudi. She says Diddy blew up his car. Just one day after the lawsuit was filed, Diddy and Cassie settled outside of court. That one settlement, of course, people are saying that that's the, that settled so fast, and that's an indication that you know there weren't really any merit, you know, that their merits there, and they wanted, you know, they wanted to sort of shut her up. Multiple other women also filed suit against Diddy under the New York Survivor Act. Joy Dickerson Neal says Diddy raped her back in 1991 when she was a student at Syracuse University. Her lawsuit alleges Diddy recorded the rape and passed around the videotape to other people. Joy calls this revenge porn and has demanded a jury trial. Liza Gardner also says Diddy raped her in New York in the early 90s and also alleges at one point he became so irate that he began assaulting and choking her to the point that she passed out. Jane Doe says Diddy raped her in 2003 when she was just a junior in high school. She says his friends met her at a club in Michigan and flew her out to Diddy's studio in New York on a private jet. She even included pictures of her and Diddy in the lawsuit. All this brings us to the major lawsuit brought on by Rodney Jones, also known as Lil Rod. His 74-page lawsuit includes similar allegations that Diddy sexually assaulted him, forced him to have sex with prostitutes, drugged him, and facilitated sex and drug trafficking schemes. On top of all this, Lil Rod says his allegations are corroborated with hundreds of hours of footage and audio recordings of Mr. Combs, his staff, and his guests engaging in some serious illegal activity because Diddy apparently required Lil Rod to record him constantly. According to experts we spoke to, these alleged recordings are likely what led up to Diddy's homes being investigated by the feds last week. Homeland Security raided one of Diddy's homes in Miami and the other in California, just down the street from where Mitra lives. You said that you live very close to where one of these raids happened in California at Diddy's home there. Did you see anything? I, I mean, yeah, when I was, you know, when I drove by, it was all there and the roads were blocked off and um, drove by a couple times after because it's right by, the, you know, my house and also the park that I, that I take my dog. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a lot of activity there and, you know, you definitely know something's happening. But I almost feel like it was like, you know, in the news before I even knew it was happening, uh, you know, by virtue of being close. So it was, you know, I knew what was going on before I even saw what was going on. As far as the raids, we don't know much yet. We can't even confirm that Diddy was the target of the raids. And to be clear, he has not been charged criminally. If we're just focusing on Diddy to start as a defendant, there's some pretty serious allegations against him. I mean, we've got rape, sex trafficking, drug trafficking, gun trafficking, um, covering up some crimes, a lot of very serious things that he could face. So is it possible that he does face these criminal charges sooner rather than later? I think we're in, you know, the evidence gathering phase. I think, you know, necessarily finding things in his home, you know, maybe, maybe not. I think we're, you know, probably going to be, the feds are probably looking at video footage. They're probably looking at financial records. They're, they're you know, also having to dig back several years. So I think it's not going to be immediate necessarily, but my sense is there's probably something there and perhaps enough to bring charges. And that's the point where it's really going to start getting interesting. So again, Diddy has not been charged criminally and neither have the celebrities whose names are also listed in Lil Rod's lawsuit. 
Also in this civil lawsuit, the most recent one filed by Little Rod, there were a lot of names that were dropped, celebrity names. So we've got Jennifer Lopez, Cuba Gooding Jr., even Prince Harry. Some people, if you read between the lines, believe that Meek Mill was mentioned or that Chris Brown was mentioned. So are people in Hollywood or in entertainment worried that they could be dragged into Diddy's allegations? Um, you know, yes and no. I think, you know, there's so many people who had business relationships with Diddy and so many artists that were tied to Diddy. I mean, he was one of the biggest producers, um, you know, in, in the past you know, a few decades, right? So there are many artists who are tied to him. And there are probably people who are very nervous, those who might have been, you know, in the studio where something possibly questionable happened or at a party or, you know, heard things. And uh, yeah, I think there's some some general nervousness around anyone who might be affiliated with him because this has gotten so big and so publicized and so many parties involved. And, you know, in the footage of Homeland Security raiding his homes, that was, you know, a few blocks from where I live. Um, and so, you know, just knowing all that was happening and seeing all that happening and, you know, what it was so um, visually aggressive <laughs> that I think people are getting a little bit nervous when you see like armored trucks and, and you know, and you see his kids on the lawn being um, in handcuffs and, and all of that. It's very dramatic. And I think that anyone who may have, you know, even slightly been aware of some of what was going on might be a bit nervous right now. Those simply listed in Lil Rod's lawsuit, like Diddy's alleged drug mule, Brendan Paul, may be nervous, and it's likely that the defendants in the suit are nervous too. As far as the defendants in the civil lawsuit, specifically Lil Rod's lawsuit that was filed back in February, we've got Diddy, his son Justin Combs, his chief of staff, some major name people, but then also there's some record labels and studios like Universal Music Group or Motown Records. I'm wondering why even bring any record labels into this and list them as defendants? Well, I think one of the number one rules of litigation, you know, like it or not, is you go after the deep pockets, right? So Diddy obviously has deep pockets, although there's some, you know, conversations going around him owning, owing $100 million in mortgages and, and things like that. So things may not always be as they seem. But when you start getting a company, you know, a label like Universal, which is one of the biggest labels, um, being named, they you know, they got a team, their own team of corporate lawyers that are uh, going to jump on it and also put pressure, um, you know, on the on the artist to either settle it out or cooperate. A lot of times when you have these agreements between various labels or his label or an artist and a label, you're going to have an indemnification clause. So we have to remember, this is a civil lawsuit. Indemnification clauses mean that if one party does something to injure the other party. So in this case, it would be if Diddy uh, created scenarios where uh, that created liability for Universal and Universal gets sued, that Diddy's going to have to flip the bill. So there's that, but you also now have this very, you know, uh, uh, label that has multiple, multiple artists um, who are very well known, who don't want to be associated with this scandal and drama that's going on. So they have a big interest. And I don't, you know, it's not surprising to me that they were named given the relationship, but it doesn't necessarily mean there are merits there. Let's take a closer look at what the lawsuit actually says about these CEOs and their companies. To start, listed as defendants, we see Chalice Recording Studios, Love Records, Motown Records, and Universal Music Group. But we also see the names Ethiopia Habtmerium and Lucian Charles Grange. Ethiopia is the former CEO of Motown Records, and Lucian Grange is the current CEO of Universal Music Group. In addition to these uh, record labels that are listed as defendants, they also list CEOs, a former CEO of Motown Records and then a current CEO of UMG. So I'm wondering why in addition to these labels, are they listing the CEOs? Yeah, they're trying to pierce the corporate veil. They're trying to say that, you know, you as individuals also were aware of these things happening. Um, what I found incredibly shocking and disturbing was that they were naming, uh, listing personal addresses of people's homes. Um, and that was, that was very surprising to me that they didn't, you know, redact that. Um, that would worry me with not only something that's so high profile, but also something that where there are a lot of, you know, 
potential, uh, um, you know, violent actors um, that are, might be tangentially involved. Um, and so that naming them individually, I think, again, is really this, um, you know, throw everything against the wall and st see what sticks and make a lot of people very nervous. So here are the allegations Lil Rod lays out against them. One, that they aided in Diddy's sex trafficking venture between about 2000 and continuing through about November 2023. That's doing things like concealing the delivery of vast sums of cash, likely millions of dollars, and failing to timely file required tax disclosures surrounding the funding of these sex trafficking parties with the federal government because doing so would imperil its ability to profit from the sex trafficking venture. So basically, Lil Rod says the record labels and their execs turned a blind eye to this alleged sex trafficking venture because if they'd stopped it, they would no longer receive any benefits from Diddy. Then Lil Rod also alleges a security breach during a September 2022 shooting in California. Lil Rod says Diddy, or his son Justin Combs, shot one of Justin's friends, who's listed in the lawsuit as the initial G. This happened at Chalice Recording Studios in LA. Here's how the record labels and execs come in. Lil Rod says Diddy, Love Records, Motown Records, Universal Music Group, and Chalice Recording Studios provided private security for the writer's camp at Chalice Recording Studios, but that this security was porous and lackluster at best. Lil Rod says it was a clear breach of duty by the record labels and recording studio to allow Diddy or Justin Combs to come inside with guns. Listed out in Lil Rod's lawsuit are talking about pretty severe things. One, that they knew about a shooting and almost helped cover it up. And then additionally, that they knew about this so-called sex trafficking empire, so to speak, and turned a blind eye. So these are pretty serious allegations. What do you make of those? I think that, you know, there, there may or may not be truth to it. It comes down to whether they had a duty um to interfere with these things happening or prevent these things from happening a duty to make sure for example a writer's workshop had sufficient security um from their perspective they're going to be saying okay well you know this was an autonomous individual and an autonomous he had his own label as well right so the relationship with universal is not black and white necessarily universal could be in you know in a partnership with diddy's label and that's typically how it's done so if if Diddy's label was simply engaged to, you know, to provide a product or a service, then that creates a little less liability than if Universal was the one hosting something like a writer's workshop and making sure, you know, in which case it would be clear that they should be the ones to make sure there is security there for what could be a host of reasons. But it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out with respect to the labels. What about the allegations that the CEOs of the labels or people high up within these labels and studios knew about this sex trafficking? Is it possible that their attorneys are now working to disprove that, that they weren't there and they had no knowledge of these allegations? I would say so. I mean, you know, first of all, what goes behind goes on behind closed doors is what goes on behind closed doors. Um, it's very possible that executives could just be saying, okay, well, there's a lot of girls around, you know, not checking ages, not knowing that, you know, if there were, uh, you know, for example, being drugged or could not give consent or, you know, these these allegations that are coming up or, you know, being flown across state lines. And these types of things are details that I don't know probably they didn't know or they didn't think about they just thought okay he's he has a lot of girls around so behind closed doors we don't really know what's going on and also having sort of you know second and third party accounts is that something that universal and their ceos should be stepping in to investigate with a huge artist that's making them a lot of money um maybe maybe not but we've already seen some pushback on this for instance with ethiopia haptamerium just this week, she spoke out about the allegations, saying, quote, being falsely accused of criminal conduct is deeply upsetting to me. I did no wrong. I never saw or participated in any alleged racketeering enterprise, and I never saw, aided, or abetted, or tried to conceal any sex trafficking activity. In short, there is no basis for any of these claims asserted against me, and I should never have been named a defendant in this lawsuit. She also says there are rumors she would testify against Diddy, but says, quote, 
I have no personal knowledge of any alleged wrongdoing by Mr. Combs, and there is nothing I would testify to that would be against his interest. Since the suit was filed in February, Ethiopia's name has been dropped as a defendant. Is it possible that the other CEO of UMG is also dropped from the lawsuit? It's possible. You know, it's possible. It depends. Um, it depends on the lawyers. It depends, you know, on the conversations that are had. I think um, I think conversations are being had at that level in addition to motions to dismiss being filed, um, which, of course, we're going to see a slew of. Um, and so this is you know this is a scenario where they're hoping they can get whoever they can get and if they can't get them they're hoping they create enough pressure so that the real parties take this even more seriously the other ceo listed in the lawsuit is lucian charles grange of umg his attorney says adding grange's name as a defendant is an attempt to fit a square peg into a round hole. So this is Donald Zacharin, who's representing Universal Music Group, Motown Records, and Grange. In a recent filing, he included sworn statements from two executives at UMG who counter what Jones alleged in his lawsuit. Zacharin also makes clear UMG has no ownership in Love Records, another defendant listed. I've also seen the reps from Universal Music Group simply saying that they want all of these allegations dismissed. What would go into that? I mean, it's already being wildly reported that they are defendants in this case, so their name is already out there. How would these so-called allegations be dismissed? I think that, you know, at this stage, there would need to be some sort of um, evidence that they could bring to light if they're going to file a motion to dismiss. I think that there would have to be something in there that really exonerated them, so to speak. I know that's criminal talk, but, you know, something that sort of uh, established that they had nothing to do, they had no knowledge. And I think that that would sort of be hard to do at this early phase without any discovery, without seeing any evidence. It, it might be sort of too early to see if a judge would really grant a motion to dismiss, at least with some of them, you know. Mitra says it's normal that a company could be listed in a lawsuit, but things would be different on the criminal side of things. I mean, typically you don't buy, file criminal charges against, uh, you know, corporations. It would typically be against individuals um, because someone has to go to jail. But, you know, it. it I don't know that this rises to the extent of Universal being sort of secondarily liable for the criminal acts of an artist or producer who is signed to them. As far as Diddy's side of things, his rep has released several statements, um, but most of them say the same thing. There's overwhelming, indisputable proof that these allegations are false. So if you're Diddy's attorney, are you working on coming up with all of this proof? Yeah, so that's absolutely, step one is really scouring over what any possible evidence there could be. And again, this dates back several years. So this is something that is going to take some time to really dig up, like how accurate are records or surveillance videos or, you know, iPhone footage or, you know, any of that or people's statements and finding people who are willing to give statements or willing to give truthful statements in support of him. So there's a lot of work to be had there. I think that the generic statement that his lawyer started with that, you know, we deny everything is sort of what what you have to start with and then hope that you find things to um to support that but i'm more concerned with the evidence on the other side because how would you then refute that how do you establish that these things didn't happen um as opposed to it's a lot easier to try and establish that they did if there is video evidence which we're hearing there is as for now, it's unclear when Lil Rod's lawsuit could be settled. We've also talked about the previous civil lawsuits, the one specifically filed by Cassie Ventura, uh, that was settled in only one day. This lawsuit, a little bit longer and several more allegations because of its length. Is it possible that this one settles rather quickly? I know it was filed back in February, but is it possible that there's a settlement soon or that this would actually move forward in the court system? You know, it's kind of you're damned if you do or damned if you don't. If you settle early, everyone's saying, oh, there was something there and they wanted to, put, you know, sh uh, brush it under the rug. Um, and if you sort of draw it out, things come out that may or may not be true, but they're allegations and people file things and everything becomes public. So, you know, I can't really speak to what the best way for uh, him to approach this is. It could settle, um, but, you know, as far as 
being helpful to other cases and other alleged victims. I think if it goes a little bit longer, we'll get some evidence and that will be helpful as opposed to a confidential settlement, which really gives us no information. Um, so just from the perspective of other lawsuits, I think that um, it would be helpful it didn't settle and in Diddy's best interest if it did. After the slew of civil suits were filed last fall, Diddy released a statement in December reading, quote, enough is enough. For the last couple of weeks, I have sat silently and watched people try to assassinate my character, destroy my reputation and my legacy. Sickening allegations have been made against me by individuals looking for a quick payday. Let me be absolutely clear. I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. I will fight for my name, my family, and for the truth. In response to the raids of Diddy's home, his attorney released a statement last Tuesday reading, quote, Yesterday, there was a gross overuse of military-level force as search warrants were executed at Mr. Combs' residences. There is no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities or the way his children and employees were treated. As far as the allegations dropped in Lil Rod's lawsuit, Diddy's attorney Sean Hawley says, quote, his reckless name dropping about events that are pure fiction and simply did not happen is nothing more than a transparent attempt to garner headlines. We have overwhelming, indisputable proof that his claims are complete lies. Our attempts to share this proof with Mr. Jones's attorney, Tyrone Blackburn, have been ignored as Mr. Blackburn refuses to return our calls. We will address these outlandish allegations in court and take all appropriate action against those who make them. As for the case as a whole, Mitra believes there are a few reasons it has captivated the nation. Do you think that this case has garnered so much media attention, specifically because of Diddy or because of the allegations? What do you think about that? I think because of, you know, uh, what's happened in the past several years of kind of taking down, um, you know, big celebrities who thought that they could get away with all this, that, you know, Hollywood knew all this was happening and didn't say a word. And I think that there's definitely that movement and that energy of like, no, we're, you know, we're taking down another one because this is rampant everywhere. So, uh, so there's that element. And then also Diddy's, you know, that's music that a lot of people listen to and, and have listened to and when you talk about one of the biggest artists in the past few decades there is a there is a lot of you know oh okay what happened there um you know in the same way that like cosby people who might have grown up with cosby or the same people of like Har harvey weinstein who loved his movies you know there there is this there's something to be said with celebrity uh first of all the fascination with celebrity but then when you you know we like to build them up to tear them down, right? So there's also a lot of speculation and and um, interest in this. And the cast of characters keeps growing. So, you know, there's definitely going to be more things that come out along the way. And I think, you know, a lot of people will be watching. We also reached out to Lil Rod for a comment on this story and have yet to hear back. Reporting for Long Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie.